Hello student, we are going to talk about um, assessment of the cardiovascular function um, today. Next slide. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the overall, the overview of the cardiovascular system. Um, the cardiovascular system um, is a pretty important organ, right? Because when it's die, biologically you're dead. So the primary function um, or the primary job of the heart is really to propel um, the blood from its left side into the aorta and the systemic circulation to provide oxygen and nutrients to the tissue, right? So you have, um, you have the heart and you have chambers, there are four chambers, um, two ventricles and two atria. The two atria are referred to as the chambers that receive and uh, the ventricles are the chambers that pump, right? And between the chambers, you have some valves. Those valves are, some of them are between the atria and the ventricle, so they call them atria ventricular. The other ones are um, one is between the ventricle and the pulmonary artery, so it's called pulmonic um, valve, versus the one um, that is between the aorta and the ventricle, the left ventricle, and that is called aortic valve. All right. So it's important to see that in that um, the blood starts, you know, um, from the right to go to the left so that it can get oxygen. Um, it's really important to understand the flow of blood because then you can appreciate what it means when someone's heart is fail. And generally when they say fail, they're referring to the ventricles because the ventricles are supposed to pump out either to the pulmonary artery or into um, the systemic circulation. So you see the left side does the most work. You can tell it's bigger because it's pumping to the systemic circulation, All right? Next slide. All right, next slide. So um, the artery, you know, the vascular system, um, here you have the amount of blood or the cardiac output. You know, the cardiac output is the amount that is ejected from the left part, which varies depending on the body's metabolic demands, right? Um, so increases with exercise, and of course it decreases when you're at, um, at rest. After the circulating, after circulating through the body, the blood returns to the right heart through the great veins, right? You know, that is the superior and inferior vena cava, which to be delivered to the lungs to receive oxygen and remove um, carbon dioxide. Next slide. So you have high pressure, you know, um, the arterial system, um, it's pretty much, um, it's accomplished through a series of vessels, right? Um, gradually decreases in size, eventually returning or entering into the smallest vessel, which are the capillaries, um, where the actual oxygen and nutrient exchange takes place. So the capillaries is where the oxygen and nutrients take place. Um, the um, you know, so there's high pressure in the arterial system, you know. Um, the vessels are thick-walled, right, thick-walled, versus the um, venous system. The venous system, um, it's a more flexible, it's a more flexible system because it allows for the infusion of IV fluids and blood, and blood fluids. So through the veins is where you administer um, IV fluids and blood product. The pressure, with the venous system is lower, you know, the vessels contain valves, right? These valves help to prevent regurgitation or backward um, of flow. It also carries blood 
um, from the capillary bed through the venules and then back into the right heart. Again, it is very flexible because it allows for the infusion of IV fluids and blood product. Next slide. So the capillary beds. Um, capillary bell, the, the real work, you know, of the vascular system is done at the capillary bed, right? The real work. Um, here, there's a abundance of, um, you know, there's a lot of them, which makes them close to virtually every cell in the body, right? So oxygen and nutrients are delivered to the tissue through this. Um, the cellular waste are also removed. Um, again, it's so many of them, billions of them, you know, so that um, every cell um, gets close connection with them. Next slide. All right, so the anatomy of the heart. So the heart itself is hollow. It's like a fist. Um, this organ is located in the thoracic cavity, right, between the lungs. Um, it lies between the sternum and rests on the diaphragm, right? It contains it in a protective sac, right? And that sac is called pericardium, right? Um, it consists of, the pericardium consists of two layers, right? The outer layer, um, the pericardial sac or the parietal pericardium is kind of tough, you know, fibrous layer that turns inward at the base of the heart, forming the inner layer. And that inner layer is called the epicardium, right? Um, it covers the heart's surface. Between the two layers um, is what we call the pericardial um, cavity, which contains serous fluid that provides kind of a lubricant to allow the heart to beat without any type of friction, right? And the heart muscles, um, there's three. Um, the thinner outer layer of the heart muscle, you know, it's called epicardium. You know, it's continuous with the inner layer of the pericardial sac. And the thicker middle layer is called the myocardium, right? It is a um, muscular layer. Uh, it's responsible for the mechanical contractility um, of the heart. And then the thin layer um, is the endocardium that lies in the interior of the heart, the heart valves, and it's continuous with the inner layer or epithelium of the blood vessels. Next slide. And then you have um, um, the four chambers, right, within the heart. The four chambers, and I discussed that previously. The right and the left atrium, so there's four and two, two of the same, but it's just right, different location, and the left ventricles. The right ventricle, the right atrium received deoxygenated blood from the systemic circulation, right? through the great veins. So the veins bring the deoxygenated blood. Um, that is the inferior and superior vena cava. And then the blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle, so that atrioventricular valve, tricuspid valve opens up. It is then delivered to the pulmonary circuit through the pulmonary artery. Generally, blood, um, the artery carries oxygenated blood. This is the exception to the case. Newly oxygenated blood is returned to the left atrium, right? through the pulmonary vein. Again, that's that difference here. It flows to the left ventricle and is then ejected into the aorta to the systemic circulation, All right? The heart needs valves, like I said. Those valves, you know, to help facilitate one way. So they're supposed to go one way. Um, the AV valve between the right atrium and the ventricle, like discussed, is called the tricuspid valve, right? The valve between the left atrium and and the ventricle is the bicuspid, right, or mitral valve. The pulmonary valve is located between the right atrium and the pulmonary artery, as discussed earlier as well. And then the aortic valve is located between the left ventricle and the aorta. Next slide. All right, so now we're talking about the cardiac conduction system. Really, really important. Um, the normal pacemaker, um, cardiac cells, you have um, SA node. The SA node, sinoatrial node, is, um, is the normal pacemaker of the heart, right? It has its own inherent heart rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. 
And then you have the atrioventricular node, which has a heart rate of 40 to 60. If other pacemaker fails, then the ventricle, the ventricular cells can generate an impulse and it has an inherent rate of 20 to 40, right? So the heart has its own exc excitability um, to respond to any stimulus and to generate its own impulse, right? Next slide. So then you have the right, um, the right and left bundle branches, right? Um, they travel down the intraventricular septum to the end of the Purkinje fibers. It extends to the impulse into the ventricular tissue, facilitating ventricular contraction. Right? A stimulus begins with the movement that produces the cardiac action potential. Right? And this is this is a process in which the membrane potentiate. Right? The difference in charge um, between the interior and exterior of the wall. Depolarization and repolarization are very important um, requirement of the heart. Depolarization is the movement of the ions proceeding and facilitating cardiac mechanism. And you can see this when you look at the um, EKG, the waves. So the P wave is what you see is this depolarization. Repolarization, again, is the movement of ions back into the resting phase, right? So it's the resting phase of the heart, right? The cardiac resting membrane potential of negative 9 volts. Right, to allow the initiation of another action potential. Right? So you see this in the T wave. Right? The ventricle, the QRS, you know, has to relax, right? So you see P wave, QRS, T. So that T wave, that relaxation, it's important. There are five phase of the action potential um, as listed there. So you have the depolarization, you know, um, repolarization, absolute refractory period, and refractory period. Next slide. So again, now we're going into the echocardiogram, right? So that EKG. The electrical activity previously described produces waveform, right? This waveform, um, these are what you see on the paper tracing. That was what we call the EKG or electrocardiogram, right? So if you want to see the electrical activity of the heart, you want to do a test called EKG or ECG, right? The P wave, like I said, corresponds with to the atrial depolarization, which produces is produced by the um, the impulse from the SA node through the atrium, right? And the PR interval, right? Um, this is the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex, right? It reflects the time required for the arterial depolarization and the delay of the impulse at the AV node. So when you what you need to do is pull out. The, um, the normal um, sinus rhythm and look at these waves that I'm talking about. The PR segment is the time immediately following the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex and represent the delay of the AV node. And then you have the QRS complex which corresponds to ventricular depolarization, right? The depolarization. So ventricular contraction occurs after the QRS and the ST segment. Okay, and that ST segment is really important, especially in a myocardial infarction. The QRS interval reflects the time required for ventricular depolarization, right? And then the T wave corresponds to the ventricular repolarization. So the T wave is repolarizing, right? So if you have the two waves, you have the ventricles, the P, the P wave represents the atria depolarized, and then you have the QRS the ventricle depolarize, and then the last phase is the resting phase, and that that's you see that with the T wave. After repolarization occur, though in this ventricular contraction, right? That's when you see that the P wave, the wave is not visible, but is buried in the QRS after the repolarization occur, right? The ST, the QT interval represent the time required for the ventricular repolarization and depolarization and depolarization. Next slide. All right, so heart weight, cardiac output is important. Um, the heart weight can be affected by many, many variables, right? Um, it is simply the number of cardiac contractions per minute. That's what the heart rate is, how, 
how much contraction per minute. Um, the normal cardiac output in an adult is about four to seven liters per minute, right? The value does not remain constant, right? Because it could be increased by exercise or decreased at rest, right? So we said that earlier. Cardiac output, when you calculate it, is a formula that we use. So it's the heart rate times the stroke volume, right? And so what is stroke volume? Stroke volume is the amount of blood that is ejected with each ventricular contraction, right? And then you have preload. Preload is the amount of blood in the ventricles at the end of diastole. So you have systolic and diastole, right? Systolic contraction, diastole relaxation. It refers to the amount of stretch the muscle tissue at the end of the filling. And then you have the afterload, um, refers to the resistance to flow the ventricle must overcome to open um, the valves and eject its content, right? Contractility, these are terms, and you should know these terms, refers to the force of the mechanical contraction, right? Contractile force can be increased with um, any type of sympathetic stimulation or calcium release. Next slide. So there are some diagnostic tests that we can do um, to assess um, the cardiac system. So you have um, laboratory markers as predictors. So the lipid panel, you know, so that includes the total cholesterol that we can look at. That includes the low density lipoprotein, LDLs, and then the high density lipoprotein, HDL, and triglyceride. You can also do homocysteine, um, which is an amino acid, um, and it actually it can implicate, you know, the development of heart disease, right? Um, it can damage the lining of the arterial walls, causing clot formation. So homocysteine is not good, right? So we can monitor the level of that to see how much the patient has. And then you have um, laboratory tests for an acute cardiac damage or injury. Um, this include enzymes or proteins that are elevated in response to this cellular injury. Specifically, some of them are specific to cardiac tissues, some of them are just generalized and must be evaluated with other tests, right? So for example, um, creatine kinase, that's the CK, right? It's a general marker, right, of cellular injury. So if someone has injury to the other muscles other than the heart, that will be elevated so it's not specific to heart. Troponin is in, it's another specific marker of the cardiac muscle damage and its presence, you know, is usually indicative of cardiac injury, so troponin. And of course, we talked about the EKG or ECG, which is the basic diagnostic assessment that we use to complete routinely on patients, you know, um, that, you know, have some electrical conduction problems with the heart, all right? And then, of course, you have your chest x-ray, um, general screening tool, um, it provides information about the size, the shape, and any in the position of the heart. And then you have echocardiogram. So echocardiogram is not electrical activity. It's looking at the structure of um, the heart. So it uses the ultrasound to produce information on the size and pumping function of the heart, the blood volume status, and also the valve function is integrity. So. Um, there are two common type of um, echocardiography. So you have the TEE, transthoracic echocardiogram, or, or transesophageal echocardiogram. So you have the one that goes around your chest, which is non-invasive, and you have the one that will go through the mouth, through the esophagus to get closer to the heart. So that's a little bit more definitive. And then you have um, a cardiac stress test, right? It's done to evaluate the heart function during times of increased workload, right? It's the best way to evaluate the functional ability of the heart. Next slide. So cardiac cath. The cardiac catheterization, again, this is invasive, right? It's an invasive x-ray um, that, um, you know, doing radio opaque catheter, um, it's advanced, you know, through the artery of the vein um, to the heart under some fluoroscop 
fluoroscopy um, in order to evaluate the cardiac feeling pressure. So it's looking at the pressure. It's also looking at the cardiac output, and it's also looking at the valvular function of the heart. You know, a right heart cath, you know, it's done through a suitable vein, and generally the femoral, the brachial, or the subclavian vein, right? So the catheter is advanced to the right heart, you know, via the inferior of the, uh, or inferior vena cava, inferior superior vena cava, whereas the left cardiac cath is done through a suitable artery, right? So one is artery, one is vein. So that's a significant difference, right? Um, through a suitable art, um, artery, so femoral, brachial, or radial, right? So the, cat, the catheter is then advanced through the aorta and into the left heart, right? Makes sense. And then you have another test called coronary angiography, right? So the primary reason for this is um, cardiac cath is performed, right? It is the left side cardiac cath with the purpose of inspecting um, the coronary arteries for blockage and determine the necessity of to revascularize, um, you know, the patient's um, artery or bypass, a bypass surgery. It's done, um, of course, it's invasive, so we need consent um, signed for all these invasive procedure. Next slide. Um, so um, age-related changes are, uh, occur. So um, the older person, there's physical deconditioning. Um, there is atrophy of the left ventricle. There's decreased elasticity of the aorta. The valves are rigid. So the pumping is going to be affected here. Um, heart disease is the number one cause of death in the elderly, in general, the population. Um, other changes, the stenosis of the heart valves, stiffening of the arterial walls, increased fibrosis of the heart chambers, which will lead to hypertension. And of course, there's formation of atherosclerotic plaques and narrowing of the, the blood vessel. That ends, that ends the, um, this section of assessment. But one thing you need to know is also the nurse's job is to assess the lungs, I mean, assess the heart. So placement of the stethoscope is really important. So it's second in a cost of space when you put there um, on the left, on the right, and then on um, second in a cost of space on the left, third in a cost of space, fourth in a cost of space, and then fifth in a cost of space, mid clavicular line. You're listening for um, normal heart sound, which is S1, S2, lub dub, or abnormal, so you see S3, S4. Um, and also to see if the point of maximum impulse has displaced. So when the patient is, um, has hypertension or the heart is larger, that um, the um, pulse of maximum impulse can be displaced. So it's not a fit in a costal space mid clavicular line. It shifts to the left because um, the heart is larger and that makes sense. Um, also making sure that you assess the, um, the jugular veins. They should be flat at low level and they should, should disappear after a certain degree, all right? And so for the assessment, it's important to really get some really good information, the history. So you start off with um, a chief complaint, if it's a medical, if it's a physical exam, you know, the issue why they came in is a medical exam. You would do a review of system of the heart, so you're gonna ask about any palpitation, any shortness of breath, any weight gain, those kind of things to suggest if the heart, there's a problems with the heart. You wanna ask about all the different types of drugs that they're taking, um, prescribed or non-prescribed drugs, and so forth. And of course, you know, think about all the consent that needs to be signed, and also you wanna think about, um, you know, um, making sure that, you know, the nursing diagnosis that may um, may be necessary when a patient is going for this procedure. So anxiety, knowledge deficit, you know, and so forth. All right.